Hey, Howard the Humongous. How's it going? It's Julia, the brain. Um, I was just reading your book and I really, really enjoy it, but I do have some questions. But since I'm not in college, because I can't afford it, I was just wondering if I can come over and ask you some questions myself. Yeah? Awesome. I'll be there in one second. It's Beauty and the Brain, bringing you the second coming of Howard the Humongous. Want to know why? Ask how. This is the brain, and I am the beauty. All right, mm. Howard, give me the truth. Oh my God, what truth would you like, dearest? So you claim that you have some truths about the universe, is that right? New discoveries, new concepts that you want to discuss and share with the world? Well, I don't believe it. Yeah, okay, there's no such thing as new truths, because okay. every truth is provisional, you know? Every truth is just poking a finger a little bit further than fingers have ever been poked before. Okay. So every truth depends on how good your finger is. Okay. And how good you are at interpreting what you're getting from your finger. And how good this is your is, finger? How good is my finger? Well, that one, I don't know. But this <laughs> one, um, no, the real point is, okay, um, we're talking about, I've just spent two years writing a new book, yes. right? Um, I've just been explaining that writing a new book is an amazing process. Because now, and I was going to tell you a story, and this won't seem to have anything to do with books or truth. But once upon a time, there was a musician named Bill Chinnick. And he was a guitarist. And he was the fastest guitarist you'd ever seen in your life. Mm -hmm. And he was playing at a little club in New Jersey. Unfortunately, Bill didn't write great songs, <laughs> despite the fact that he was just an amazing guitarist. So he didn't get to do Madison Square Garden. He was doing little clubs. He's doing a little club in New Jersey. And he's doing his astonishingly fast guitar stuff. And when it's all over, a little old man comes up to the stage and says, how the hell did you do that? And Bill said, well, I grew up listening to Les Paul records. And I sat there with my guitar and with my record player and played and played and played. And it took me years. But after a couple of years of really intensely playing, I got to be able to play like Les Paul. And the little old man said, son, my name is Les Paul. Mm -hmm. And I can't play like that. Don't you realize I invented six track taping? That's six of me. Can you come over to my house and do that in my den all over again? Well, of course Bill could. So when you're reading a book, especially this one, this book's been through at least 150 passes. This book is not just me. This book is 150 of me. This book is 150 of me linked up like a supercomputer. This is 150 of me on one of the greatest intellectual adventures that I'd ever undertaken. I never expected it to be that. I had no idea what I was about to fall into, but I fell into a realm of utter surprise in which everything we know about just about everything turns out to be wrong. I was off on the track of a mystery. When I was 19 years old, I came up with a new theory of how the universe creates. And it went like this. Okay, I put you in my place. So you're 19 years old. You're, you've grown up in Buffalo, New York. Your parents have just put you on a train and shipped you on a three-day and three-night journey to Portland, Oregon. <laughs> and you're going to a little college called Reed College. Now, it's a little college, and most people haven't heard of it. But the fact is, the year that you're going... Your class has the highest median SATs of any school in the country, higher than Harvard, higher than MIT, higher than Caltech, and higher, well, I guess that's just about everything that you need to be higher than. That. <laughs> and so there you are, you're in your first day of math class, and you're a really, really brainy bunch. And the teacher walks in with a tiny little sack of papers, and she hands them to the student on her right. She takes over the position at the head of the conference table that you're all sitting at, and says, pass these around. Okay, you get your copy. And you look at it, and it's half a sheet of paper. That's all it is. It's 165 bloody words. Now, you don't understand a word, not a single word on that page. So what is the page? It's five rules. It's five simple rules that are so complex that almost nobody can understand them. But they're basically five simple rules. And your assignment for the rest of the year is every week to extract an implication, something that's implied by these five rules to extract a corollary, something that logically emerges if these five rules are true. 
And you do that week after week after week, but only one out of 10 of you can do it. You're the smartest students in the country and only one out of 10 of you can do it. Like and that's conditional of the class or that's just what happens? That's only... what happens okay. in this particular class, which means you have a unique privilege. You've been a science nerd ever since you were 10 years old and discovered microbiology and theoretical physics. Mm -hmm. So no girls have ever wanted to have anything to do with you at all. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, because you're one the, among the one out of 10 who's able to do this homework assignment, girls start flocking around you. Now, unfortunately, their motives are not what you would like. Mm -hmm. They're flocking around you because they need help with their homework. Mm -hmm. And you're one of the very few in the class who can handle this stuff. And so they leave you for real men as soon as their homework is over, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But at least it gets you a little closer to girls than usual. Okay. <laughs> By the end of the year, you have extracted so many corollaries, so many implications from this 165 words mm -hmm. that you have the entire mathematical system that you learned in grammar school. Eight years of grammar school, eight textbooks worth, that's about 22 pounds worth of math textbooks, and they were all inside of 165 words waiting for you to yank them out. How the hell did that happen? Well, that's not the question that appears that occurs to you in the beginning. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, you think, well, what if the universe is like a student at Reed College doing her homework? What if the universe starts out with four, three, five simple rules, and then simply homework assignment by homework assignment pulls out their implications mm. and pulls out all the complexities that we know as a universe. Well, you put that aside because you're only 19 years old. But, but because you're a science junkie, because you're a participant in the scientific thought process, you start running into the fact that the current way of looking at how the universe, first of all, the question of how the universe creates isn't being brought up by anybody. Nobody's asking this astonishing question. Mm -hmm. How does a universe go? Well, we'll take you to a little thing and then we'll ask a question about it, okay? I'm going to take you to a coffee table at the beginning of the universe, before the beginning of the universe. And you and I are sitting around at this coffee table before the beginning of the universe. And, and you are a visionary and have all kinds of amazing ideas. And I'm a crusty old fart. I am cantankerous as hell. I rely on logic, period. And if it's not logical, it isn't going to happen. I'm the one who's the realist, at least in my opinion. You are the one who's out to lunch, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. While we've been sitting around, we've been piling up the coffee cups by the thousands. And one day, you say, see that little space over there? Well, there is no space over there because there's no time or space. But okay, I'll go along with you on this. And you say, there's going to be a pinprick infinitely smaller than a pinprick that comes popping out of the nothingness. And it's going to explode. It's going to expand at a speed so fast you will find it utterly unbelievable. And I say, Julia, Julia, maybe we should call me the brain and you the beauty. No. Because. Preposterous. Yes, because. Um, Add nothing to nothing, and what do you get? One plus one equals two. Nothing plus nothing equals nothing. nothing. Garbage in, garbage That's my out. Brain. Yes, nothing <laughs> in, nothing out. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't get a pinprick by adding a bunch of nothing. Yeah. And all of a sudden, whammo, whoosh! This pinprick, infinitely smaller than a pinprick, emerges over there, and it starts exploding at super speed, expanding. And it's not just expanding, Julia. It's expanding with these qualities that we call time, space, and energy. Time, space, and speed. That mm -hmm. speed with which it's expanding, that's energy. Speed is energy. And I'm dumbfounded. Not only did you get a pinprick infinitely smaller than a pinprick, just as you had proposed, but it has these new qualities called space and time. Where the fuck did those come from? For God's sakes, it's impossible. Well, you are blasé. You act as if nothing important is happening. You just swizzle your coffee a little bit. And then you say, okay, you see that giant unfurling sheet of space and time moving at astonishing speed, like a giant's handkerchief when he's just sneezed. <laughs> um, and the handkerchief itself expands. Well, and it has these qualities called time and space, you tell me. 
well, yes, I know that. What does, what does that amount to? And you say, I predict any second now, it's going to precipitate the way that raindrops precipitate from a storm cloud, and it's going to precipitate in things. Things, Julia, give me a break. Add space and time to space and time, and what do you get? Space and time, honey bunch. <laughs> That's all you get. Mm -hmm. the, there's a reason, Julia, that they call this place in which we've been sitting at a cafe table forever, nothing. Mm -hmm. They call it nothing. Look at that word carefully. No thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's built into the very nature of the medium we're living in, and you're telling me there are going to be things this is ridiculous. <laughs> and all of a sudden, only 10 to with 32 zeros after it, slivers of a second, really, really, at the very beginning of things, wham up! This exploding sheet precipitates in things. And there are gazillions of them. Well, it's I knew that ridiculous. Would happen, so. <laughs> yes, you knew that would happen, but what the fuck is happening in this universe? It's not living according to the laws of logic. Mm -hmm. It's breaking the laws of logic. It is not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to be right. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be wrong, right? Maybe this is why they call it you the brain. At any rate, nobody has bothered in science to ask the question of how in the world this comes to be. Yes, Richard Dawkins has written a bunch of books about accident after accident after accident piling up and being selected for by natural selection. And Susan Blakemore, who is a big follower of his and has written quite a few very good books herself, Susan Blakemore says, but Richard Dawkins has asked this question. No, not on the cosmic level that you're asking it. All this ridiculous stuff is happening. Mm -hmm. And... And you, I mean, here you are, you've, you've been at Reed College, you've been following the course of modern cosmologies, it comes up with this picture of the universe that we're talking about right now, and you wonder, where the hell did the pinprick come from? Where the hell, how in the hell did space, time, and energy manage to precipitate as things? How in the world did that turn into stars, galaxies, trees? Matter. Yeah, matter, earthworms, the whole thing. Even the stuff you flush down the toilet periodically. <laughs> How in the world did any of this stuff happen? And you figure, okay, you'll call this the God problem. Now, the God problem comes uh, around because of another stupid thing that happened to you. You're, you're 12 years old, and you've been in science for two years of your life now, intensely into science, microbiology and theoretical physics primarily. Your mom has dragged you off to the University of Buffalo in your hometown, and has, uh, has introduced you to the head of the graduate physics department, and you've been ushered into his office for what is probably a five-minute meeting, because what head of a graduate physics department in his right mind wants to meet with a fucking 12-year-old, for God's sakes? Your mom, God knows how many arms she's had a twist to get this courtesy meeting. And you don't come out of the office for an hour. And you don't come out of the office for, the, for an hour, because in 1955, when this is happening, the big battle topic the big mud wrestling match in theoretical physics is whether there was a big bang at the beginning of the universe or whether this is what's called a steady state universe that's just churning out matter continuously well the guy who's the head of the graduate physics department discovers that this hot topic of the day he can discuss for an hour straight and have a fascinating time with you a 12 year old nerd right so You've been into science a long time, and you read the arguments of Bertrand Russell about God. Mm -hmm. And Russell, to sum up a long argument, basically says, okay, so we need a designer to create a really complicated universe, right? Well, a designer has to be even more complicated than the universe he's designing, right? And if that's the case, if you need a designer for everything complicated, who designed God? So you don't believe in a God. But this leaves you with a problem, you little punk. And that problem is this. If no God said, let there be light, how did we get this weird stuff called light? If no God parted the heavens and the earth, how in the world did we get heavens and earths? Planets, stars, galaxies. How did we get that pinprick at the beginning of the universe? How did we get the very first things? So you now are stuck with an obligation. Having dismissed God from the universe, you have to explain Genesis. You have to explain how things come to be. 
Well, eventually, many, many, many years later, you find a, an editor who is willing to allow you to do this and write a book about it. So you now have the freedom to go after this topic to see if your corollary generator theory, your theory that the universe could be like a Reed College student doing her homework, homework assignment after homework assignment, and unfolding an entire universe as an implication, a set of implicit properties in a set of simple rules at the beginning of the universe. You can now check out to see if there's any validity to this theory. And you've spent 50 years putting together a picture step by step of exactly what the universe did to create itself. You know the what, but you don't know the how. And you think, okay, this is going to be easy. I'll go and see who's asked the God problem before. Who's asked the question of how a godless cosmos creates itself? So you go back to the usual suspects. You go all the way back to Kepler. And you figure Kepler must have asked this question. And it turns out Kepler was a creationist. Kepler was a believer in intelligent design. Kepler thought that the Bible was right and that God had created the universe in seven days pretty much the way the Bible says. So for Kepler, there's no God problem. Okay, you take Galileo. I mean, remember, Galileo got in a lot of trouble with the Pope. Surely Galileo must have asked the God problem, how a godless cosmos creates. No, it turns out that Galileo was a creationist too. That Galileo said something a little weird and it got him in a lot of trouble. He said that there are inaccuracies in the Bible, like about the sun standing still, because this is a propaganda piece. And God wrote a propaganda piece to appeal to the masses. So he made certain distortions in order to appeal to the mass mind. But, said Kepler, there's another book in which God writes the real deal, the real truth of the way he goes about doing things. It's called nature. And if you read the book of nature, you find that nature obeys God's laws and rules precisely. Nonetheless, he's got a God. And there's no question about how in the world any of this stuff came to be, because it's all in the Bible. Even if it is distorted to please the masses. Mm -hmm. So you turn to Newton, and you discover Newton, another creationist and um, intelligent design fanatic who believes that what's in the Bible is pretty much the whole story and you don't need to ask the question. So you discover that nobody really is asking the question no matter what Susan Blakemore says about Richard Dawkins. And, and Richard is an amazing writer and an amazing mind and well worth reading his books. And that's an understatement. So here you are stuck with a God problem and you have this corollary generator hypothesis. And you want to see if it'll hold up. And you want, and you've, you've got another problem, Julia. Remember, those, if you're going to explain corollary generator theory, you're going to have to tell people about Piano's axioms, the five axioms that were on that piece of paper at Reed College. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, they're utterly incomprehensible. And you can't think of a way to explain it clearly and delightfully to an intelligent audience. Mm -hmm. So you figure, okay, I'll tell the story of Piano's axioms. I'll tell you how Piano's axioms came to be. That sounds, you know, a reasonable strategy. Then they'll have a feel for it, even if they can't understand the precise words. So you go back to find out what the story is behind Piano's axioms. And you figure, okay, we'll start with a little history of mathematics, since Piano was a mathematician. And you figure, okay, well, um, it's, it's so clear. The, the history of mathematics is ridiculous. We made our first settlements 11,000 years ago um, by piling huge numbers of boulders together and making walls. And the first buildings that we made were round. And the first walls that we made were round. So that gave us the concept of the circle. That would be 11,000 years ago in Jericho, the very first city. Easy, right? The beginning of mathematics. Right. And then, about 2,000 la years later in Turkey, not all that far away from Jericho, maybe 700 miles, there, was, there were these people who were living in, in this state of utter dire misery during the raining season because they were inundated. They were um, besieged by toxic waste. And you, you were stuck walking around in this waste that went up to your knees. And it was so thick and gooey that it wore you out. You know how you get worn out just trying to walk in when, when you're in water up to your chest? 
and you wonder how in the world you could ever handle this if you were stuck in it on a regular basis because even getting 20 feet wears you out. Well, try that in something solid. This toxic waste is called mud and it can kill you because if you're old or if you're a child and you wear out your energy and you still haven't gotten somewhere, you collapse right where you are. In fact, there are bog people who've been discovered, people who got bogged down in the mud and never made it out again. Um, they're still very well preserved, but they're not alive, which is a small problem. Um, so there's this toxic stuff and some brilliant visionary comes up with the idea, I mean, this is crazy, comes up with a crazy idea. The crazy idea is we'll take this stuff and we'll pat it into rectangles. Rectangles? What are you talking about? There is no such thing as a rectangle. There's never been a rectangle. We've never seen one any place on this planet. And if we knew more about the universe, we'd know that there aren't any rectangles anywhere in the universe either. What the fuck are you talking about? This is toxic waste, for God's sakes. Well, the visionary, again, you're the visionary. I'm the idiot. I mean, I'm the one who's smart, okay. right? And, um, and you say, we're going to pat this into rectangles. Okay, so even if you pat it into rectangle, and we're going to leave it in the sun to dry. Okay, so even if you leave it in the sun to dry, what are you going to do with the damn thing? And you tell me, well, we'll get about 60 million of them together. What? <laughs> You're talking about a bunch of people who need to feed themselves and clothe themselves and work their tails off just to get enough food to survive, putting in, what, three hours a day for how many years, 30 years or something like that? All of us just making these little patties of toxic waste, um, and it's going to amount to something? And you say, yeah, in fact, here's what it's going to amount to. And you sketch out your nutty idea of an apartment complex, mm -hmm. three-room apartment. Identical apartments for absolutely everybody, with walls on the outside that enemies can't penetrate. Their arrows won't penetrate them, their spears won't penetrate them, we'll be safe as could be. All we have to do is lock ourselves in our apartments. Julia, give me a break. First of all, there's never been any such thing as an apartment and there never will be. Mm -hmm. You're talking about making an apartment from toxic waste, you've got to be crazy. The stuff is toxic, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about doing it with these crazy things called rectangles? Give me a break. And you're talking about all of us working for 30 years just to make these mud patties of yours? Really? I mean, come on. How can you be so for <laughs> Um And sure enough, you convince everybody to do this for 30 years, and they make enough of these mud patties that they create a city. It's called Katal Hayok. And it has enough apartment rooms for 60,000 people. And you turn out to be right, you idiot. And I turn out to be wrong when we know I'm right. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and that's the second stage in mathematics, you figure, you know, because you're on the trail of telling the story of Piano's axioms. Mm -hmm. And um, so you figure, okay, when they made walls, these are the first straight walls. These are the first flat surfaces. Um, these are the first 90 degree angles the universe has ever seen. Mm -hmm. Ever. Ever. Yeah. And you figure, okay, that's the next step in mathematics. So. The right angle was just invented. you. You've just convinced this whole army of people, a whole tribe, to go out and make mud patties and put them in the sun and do it in a rectangular shape. And, okay, and you've created the very first flat surfaces and the very first 90 degree angles. And, okay, now you're an author and you're trying to figure out how you're going to explain the history of Piano's axioms since you can't explain the axioms themselves. And, um... You figure, okay, step one in mathematics was in Jericho, where they built round buildings and came up with the idea of the circle. Uh, step two in the development of mathematics was in Katal Hayok 2,000 years later, approximately 8,000 years ago, when they came up with the first plane surfaces, flat surfaces, and the first 90 degree angles, and that gave you the angle. And you write this up. Why? Because you've done a little bit of research. And all the reference books say, yeah, this is credible. This, this is the way it happened. And um, Bertrand Russell, in particular, who's written a history of Western philosophy that has a complete history of mathematics, Bertrand Russell says, because the next step you're about to take is this. Well, we'll get to what Bertrand Russell said in a second. The next step is the Mesopotamians. And the Mesopotamians took advantage of building walls with stone and making these mud patties in the shape of rectangles and having flat walls and 90 degree angles and rooms. Because remember, in Kalhaliuk, you invented the room. Mm -hmm. You invented the nuclear family. Why? <laughs> because with a three person apartment, you could have families living separately from each other mm -hmm. for pretty much the very first time. You, you invented privacy. 
<laughs> when you invented apartments. You invented so many things that it was ridiculous. You gave adolescents all they ever wished for. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but in Babylon, approximately 5,000 years ago, things took the next big step forward. Why? Because the Babylonians, and it says this everywhere you look, invented the angle and they invented the 360 degree circumference of a circle. Very important concepts. Okay, so these are your basic first steps in the development of mathematics. The circle, mm -hmm. the flat plane with the 90 degree angle, the angle itself with its ability to rotate around 360 degrees. So you write all of this up. It's just preliminary stuff. You're gonna put it in three pages to introduce Piano's axioms and how we got to Piano's axioms. But you, being a, an anally retentive, super compulsive, detail-driven individual, mm -hmm. go nuts. <laughs> you go nuts because you want to give your reader a sense of what it is to hold a Babylonian protractor in your hand and measure out an angle. And to give your reader this haptic sense, this touch sense, of what it is to work with a protractor, you need to know what the Babylonians made their protractors out of. Finally, after a month, something dawns on you. Maybe you can't find the material they made their protractors from because they didn't have any protractors. And that's the beginning of a discovery. And it's the beginning of a discovery that basically everything you've ever been told about history is in some sense exceedingly wrong. Because Bertrand Russell was wrong. The Babylonians did not invent the 360 degree circle. They did not invent the angle. In fact, the more you get into it, the more it becomes obvious the Babylonians didn't have a clue as to what an angle was. The Babylonians didn't have a clue as to what a circle was. The irony is they used compasses and they drew circles as decorative objects, perfect circles. But they never took the circle from their decorative stuff and uploaded it into the toolkit of the mind. They never made it a concept. So you're stuck with a revelation here that the way we think everybody thinks, we think everybody knows what a right angle is. No, in the days of the Babylonians, in the days of the people of Katal Hayuk, in the days of the people of Jericho, they didn't have a clue. What the Babylonians have invented is writing, which they do by making dents in wet clay, and the clay hand tablet, which is approximately the size of an iPhone. And they also invented the table. Hmm. You know, like mathematical tables, learning your math tables, they invented that. And because they invented the table and cross-hatching a grid and putting some things on lines and some things on columns, that's the way they see the entire universe. Lines, columns, grids, rows, that's it. So when they look at the sky, guess what? They don't see a big hemisphere above our heads. They haven't invented the hemisphere yet. The hemisphere is a big step even beyond the circle. And you try to, and, and another thing dawns on you. Well, we're all, we've all been told the Babylonians invented astronomy. That means looking up at the sky, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, it doesn't mean looking up at the sky. The Babylonians have invented these things they make lines with, right? Mm -hmm. So for them to understand something, they have to reduce it entirely to lines. So they never look up. What they, at least not when they're doing their astronomy, they don't bother to look up. What do they look at? Something they can measure in terms of lines. They look at where the moon comes up on the horizon, where the sun comes up on the horizon, where the stars come up on the horizon. Once they go above the horizon, it's not our business anymore. Once they come up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, said Werner von Braun. Um, a line from an old Tom Lehrer song. So you discover Babylonians astronomers don't look at the sky. They look at the horizon. That's it. And they keep track of what things come up in the vicinity of other things. For example, they keep track of, it turns out that the moon and the sun come up in the sky at about the same place. In fact, from Babylon, it looks as if they both come out of the same mountain. That that mountain is, it's the birthplace of the gods. Because every morning you can, and every night you can see either the moon or the sun come blipping from behind that mountain. Obvious, gives birth to the gods, right? And the sky to them 
is represented by, you know, we humans, we take our technologies and we turn them into metaphors. And so the sky is obviously a roof, right? And roofs are flat, right? So for them, the sky is absolutely flat, except they don't bother to look at the sky when they're doing astronomy, so it doesn't matter. What matters is the horizon. That's it. Well, okay, when you were 10, you were growing up in Buffalo, New York. There wasn't a soul who wanted to have anything to do with you. Adults didn't want to have anything to do with you. It was two years before you were to meet the head of the graduate physics department at the University of Buffalo. Kids didn't want to have anything to do with you. And the makeup lady again. And one day, you're sitting in your family's great big living room. It's totally empty. The lights are not on. The big velvet curtains are drawn, even though it's the middle of the day, and there's a book in your hands. And the book in your hands says, the first two rules of science are these. The truth at any price, including the price of your life. And it gives the example of Galileo. And it gives it all wrong. It tells you that Galileo would have willingly gone to the stake, like Giordano Bruno, Bruno, who actually did go to the stake, for saying that there are many worlds up in the sky and they all have life on them. He was burned alive for that. Um, and the book pretends that Galileo would have willingly gone to the stake and been burned alive too in order to defend his truth, that the earth goes around the sun, not the other way around. Well, that's not true, but it's a mythologized version. And in the mythologized version, where Galileo would have willingly fought off the stake and gone to the stake, he, what, what you're told about Galileo, as wrong as it is, represents an ideal of courage that grabs you by the guts. Absolutely grabs you by the guts. And you resonate to that frequency intensely. And the second rule of science, according to this book, is look at things right under your nose, as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. Look at things that you and everybody around you take for granted, as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. Look for the things that you and everybody around you take for granted, and then proceed from there. Well, the adventure, the two-year adventure of putting together the God problem, much as I thought, you know, I spent 50 years studying history. I spent 50 years studying science. You would think that would be enough to get it right, right? I discovered that everything I thought I knew was wrong that everything that we know, in general, is wrong. That Kepler did not use what we call math. Not at all. Kepler is famous for coming up with the three laws of planetary motion. Take all of Kepler's books and search them for the phrase, three laws of planetary motion. Guess what? You won't find it. Because the three years laws of planetary motion are done with what we call math. And what we call math is equations. And equations are so central to our math that some of the most important scientists in the world, Steven Weinberg, for example, who is way up there in the scientific pantheon, will tell you the entire universe is equations. And they don't mean that as a metaphor. They mean the cosmos is equations. That stars are equations, for God's sakes. The fact is we've only had equations for 300 years or so. And that Kepler did not have a single clue as to what an equation is. And as a consequence, he used something we don't even think of as that mathematical anymore. He used geometry. And if he wanted to solve a difficult problem, he didn't make it right out an equation. He'd never seen an equation in his life. He drew a circle, and he took his straight edge, and he drew triangles, or octa, octa, octa whatever they are octagons, octahedrons, octa whatever they are, and or or you know, various geometric figures inside the triangle, sometimes drawing as many as forty lines inside the triangle with God inside knows how many I mean inside the circle, thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. inside the circle, in order to solve a problem. He wasn't using what we call math, he was using what we call geometry. So it turns out that Galileo didn't use math as we know it either. Galileo used geometry, period. No equations. No equations whatsoever. It's not until we get to Sir Isaac Newton, which is relatively late, 16, roughly 1648 to 1720, um, that 120 years after Galileo and Kepler, that, that equations even came into the picture. Now look, the first two rules of science that you learned from that book included 
Look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before and then proceed from there. Look at things that you and everybody around you take for granted as if you've never seen them before and then proceed from there. And you're beginning to learn that there are a lot of assumptions that aren't true. That aren't true. For example, we assume that everybody knows what a circle is. Well, the way we know a circle? No, nobody knew what a circle was in the sense that we know what a circle was until the Greeks came along and invented our concept of the circle, which is just one among many possible concepts of the circle. The same thing with the angle. Even though the Babylonians had to build their buildings with perfect right angles or their buildings would fall apart, they didn't know what a right angle was. They did not have a special name for a right angle. All they knew was that, practically speaking, they had to get the damn thing right or the building would fall down. And when you're trying to build, build buildings to challenge the gods and to awe and astonish your neighbors, buildings like ziggurats, which were the first skyscrapers, mm -hmm. the ones that the Bible complains about in the house story of the Tower of Babel, because they were so arrogantly reaching toward the sky. Don't get your angles right, and buddy, your building will fall down. And the king, or emperor, or whatever he happens to be, who has demanded that you make this in order to awe his enemies, and bring people flocking to your country, begging to be taken as friends, allies, by him, the building falls down, what's the emperor going to do to you? The architect. <laughs> yeah, right. So, and despite that, you don't have a concept for it. So you discover that there is a toolkit of the mind. You discover that there are a bunch of concepts in that toolkit. You discover that an awful lot of the concepts that we think are just part of nature, part of the world outside of us, they're not part of the world outside of us. They're part of the world inside of us. They're part of our interior toolkit with which we see. And when you see the limitations of that interior toolkit, suddenly you realize it's possible to have other mind tools. What other things are right under our nose, the way mud was right under our nose, the way the circles were right under the nose of the people of Jericho, that we haven't uploaded to the toolkit of the mind? How do we get them up there so we can use them as concepts? So you begin to see that it is possible to take rule number two of science and find things right under our nose that go far beyond what you've ever imagined uncovering before. And then one day, you have another, you have an accident. Um, you, you take buses to see your relatives. So you figure, okay, you're getting into this book by Aristotle. It's called The Posterior Analytics. The name is so obscure that even you can't remember it. So there you are on the bus. Sure enough, there's no Wi-Fi, which turns out to be an act of good luck for you. And you read the damn book. And on a hunt page 158 and 159, you find the entire program of modern science, including a whole mess of mind tools we use every single day that we utterly take for granted and never question. And never question at all. And you come across, you discover that Aristotle is the guy who put the axiom on the map. Here you are looking for the roots of Piano's axioms. Piano's five simple rules. Well, now you've got a little bit of history of Piano's five simple rules because Aristotle, it turns out, came up with the concept of the axiom and planted it right in the middle of scientific thinking. Uh, secondly, Plato or Aristotle turns out to be, to be the guy who said, you can break things down into the smallest units of which they are made, their elements. And then you can discover the laws that govern their elements. Let's call those, he says, elementary laws. Elementary laws? Well, you've been running across this expression, elementary laws, all your life. And like the circle, it seems that it's something that's built into nature. Of course, everybody who's got a brain is going to look for elementary laws, right? No, it's an arbitrary concept. It's an arbitrary concept that Aristotle planted in our vocabulary 2,300 years ago, and we haven't been questioning it. And the assumption that once you understand the elementary laws of something, you can understand what makes it work. Today we call that reductionism. And today Brian Greene, the guy who goes on television and tells you all about string theory um, with the elegant universe and series of that kind, Brian Greene says in one of his books that tell me where all the particles are in the universe and I can understand the entire universe. Hey, Brian, wake up. 
you got that idea from Aristotle. Now it's important to question whether it's true. Look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. And Brian's not looking right under his nose. And you turn it, it turns out for you in the course of putting this book together, you realize Aristotle is dead wrong. You realize Aristotle is dead wrong, for example, when you step into a situation in 1835. There's this little group of friends in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s who get together all the time. It's Thomas Henry Huxley, is this self-taught naturalist who went off on a voyage on a uh, ship of exploration, the Rattlesnake, the Voyage of the Rattlesnake. You've heard of that, haven't you? At any rate, and has come back to England and has no source of funding. So he can't write up his research. And there is a publisher named James Chapman. And James Chapman has um, signed up this young author who did a translation of a book from German about Jesus. Well, okay, a book about Jesus. Fine, the Bible's about Jesus, right? Um, it turns out that she has given a totally secular interpretation of Jesus, as if he is just another human being like you and me. Absolutely shocking. Absolutely shocking. The Lord of God knows what says that this is the worst, worst piece of trash that the flames of hell have ever coughed out. Um, and he's signed her, and he's bought a magazine that was founded by a philosopher named Jeremy Bentham. And he's put her in charge of the magazine. So she hires Thomas Henry Huxley. He's penniless. He can't write up his research. Um, she hires him as her science correspondent. And all of a sudden, Thomas Henry Huxley has some place to write for that will pay him some money. Plus... In those days, the office hasn't been invented yet, and the office building hasn't been invented yet. So James Chapman, the publisher, has an establishment. An establishment is like a big boarding house. And this young woman that he's hired to take over this publication, the Westminster Review, um, the one who wrote the scandalous book about Jesus, lives in Coventry. Well, Coventry's a long way from London, so she comes and lives in his house. Um, they have an affair. The, the affair doesn't work out, affairs usually don't, um, and, and she gives up on him romantically. Um, and John Stuart Mill, uh, the leading philosopher of the 19th century, shows up at the table. Karl Marx occasionally shows up at the table. We're talking about the table of James Chapman at his establishment um, at 142 Strand. And a guy named George Henry Lewes shows up at this establishment. And George Henry Lewes and John Stuart Mill get together to ponder a problem, a problem that demonstrates why Aristotle is dead wrong when he says, if you cut things up into their tiniest elements and understand the laws of the elements, you will understand the laws of the larger things. No, it isn't true. And these guys, it's 1835, and John Stuart Mill and George Henry Lewis are sitting around thinking about this new stuff called chemistry. And it turns out about 50 years earlier, one scientific tinkerer came up with a way of making this peculiar gas. It looked like just ordinary air. If you try to put your hand through it, it goes through just like ordinary air. Keep it in a bell jar, put a mouse in the bell jar, the mouse dies. Put a candle in the bell jar, the candle goes out. Um, and then another guy, um, Joseph Priestley, he's a minister um, and, and part of the most exciting brainstorming group that's ever been established in the history of the Western world, called the Lunar Society, which includes uh, Erasmus Darwin, its founder, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, um, it includes Watt and Bolton, the two guys who took steam engines and turned them from things the size of this building to things small enough to power just about anything that you wanted. Um, it includes um, uh, Wedgwood Ben, um, or Wedgwood, uh, one of the Wedgwoods, and they are the creators of the first factory, factories in England to make pottery, and they work with taking all kinds of materials and exposing them to all kinds of strange temperatures in order to bring out all kinds of strange properties in them, the properties of porcelain. And that's what would eventually be called thermodynamics. All these guys are in the same brainstorming group, including Joseph Priestley. And Joseph Priestley manages to extract another air that looks just like any other air, right? Transparent, put your hand through it, it's like air, right? Except if you've got a bell jar of this stuff and you put a mouse in it, all of a sudden the mouse becomes hyperactive. If you let him live in there, he lives longer than his brothers and sisters. And if you try breathing it yourself, you feel remarkably peppy. And these are the two substances, one of which will be named eventually hydrogen, and one of them will be named eventually oxygen. And they have been named. 
by the time that these two guys in 1835 are sitting around thinking about them. And here's what they're thinking. Uh -huh. If a gas is a gas is a gas, right? Both these gases are transparent. You can put your hand into them. So if you add, you've got a bell jar of hydrogen over here, and you've got a bell jar of oxygen over there. And if you add the hydrogen to the oxygen, what should you get? It's a jar of gas and another jar of gas. One plus one equals two. Add two jars of gas together and you get a gas. Um, well, you've got a, you're in for another surprise here because you add the two together. Now let's add one tiny additional element. Let's add warmth. So if you add warmth to two gases, what should you get? Slightly warmer gas, twice as much, slightly warmer gas. Okay, take your match, light it, put it in to the mixture of the two gases. Now what do you get? Well, it should be nothing more than what you can understand by understanding the elements. And the elements are a little bit of warmth from the flame and two gases. No, you get a fucking goddamn amazing explosion. Just like you got an explosion over at that cafe table at the spot, you know, the pinprick smaller than a pinprick at the beginning of the universe. An explosion? Are you kidding me? It gets worse. Gases. You know what gases are. You can see through them. You can put your hand through them and it goes through as if nothing's there except a slight breeze, right? Gas in, gas out, put in two gases, you get a gas, right? No, you get this really weird stuff. It seems to be matter because you can touch it. You can feel it with your finger. It distorts the light. It seems to be matter, but light actually goes through it and comes out distorted. What's worse, if you're a man like Joseph Priestley, It'll ball up on the table in little tiny globes. And then, if the little tiny globes roll off the table, they'll soak into your fucking pants. And if they soak into your fucking pants, you won't want to stand up for the next 20 minutes because you'll be terribly embarrassed because somebody will think you peed in your pants. <laughs> this stuff is called liquid. <laughs> this stuff is called <laughs> water. Now let's be logical about this. Garbage in, garbage out. One plus one equals two, mm -hmm. right? Two <laughs> gases and a little bit of heat is an explosion. Mm -hmm. And this stuff that soaks into your rug or can soak your shoes, give me a break, Julia. You have to be insane again. This does not follow the rules of logic. It does not follow what Aristotle told you about elementary laws. Understand the rules of these two gases, put them together, and they're two gases. No, the universe doesn't work according to the laws of logic. What you have discovered on that bus in the middle of the night, in these two pages from the posterior analytics of Aristotle, is that we've had a lot of assumptions we've been working with. For 2,300 years, Aristotle was such a master at overawing us and making us feel that he was the ultimate authority and anything he said was true, that we haven't bothered to look at the truth. We haven't bothered to look at the way the universe really behaves. And that turns out to be one of the ultimate quests of the God problem, to look at how the work, how, how the universe really behaves. And in the process, you come up with five heresies, you bloody bloke. How do you keep doing this? I mean, none of these, Julia, we know none of these things are going to work out. You're going to be wrong in every single count. Logic tells us so. Aristotle tells us so. Um, and you say heresy number one. A does not equal A. What? Of course A equals A. I mean, anybody with a brain can see that A equals A. Let's imagine that you are typing out 1A at 9 o'clock in the morning, and you're typing out your second A at 9.01, okay? Now, all the physical gestures that go into making those two A's are different. Now, they're sufficiently similar that you manage to get an A, but you're in a different mood. In that one minute, uh, 200,000 of your red blood cells have died and been replaced by other red blood cells. About the same number of cells in your gut have died in the lining of your gut and been replaced by other cells. You've had approximately a billion synaptic, uh, synaptic assemblies in your brain just fade out of sight and be replaced by other synaptic assemblies. And you register this because you know your moods are not the same and your perceptions are changing every minute. 
So even for you, those two A's are not the same. But you assume that this is something wrong with you, that in the real world, the two A's are the same. I got news for you. If those two A's are on your computer screen, there's a one set of electrons that's making the fluorescent pixels of the 1A, and there's another set of electrons that's making the fluorescent the, the pixels fluoresce for the other A. There's one set of photons that's pouring toward your eyes to make the light of the 1A, and there's another set of photons that's pouring toward your light to make the other one. But it gets worse than this, Julia, you poor baby. <laughs> it turns out that in the time it took to go from typing A number one to typing your second A, the Earth has moved 17 miles around its axis. The, um, the Earth itself, the whole planet, has moved 517 miles around the sun. The solar system has moved 864 miles around the center of the galaxy. These things are not in the same place, and they don't have the same meaning, because Julia, much as you may want to deny it for the sake of abstraction, which isn't reality, the real reality is, you do not feel the same way when you make those two different A's. In the back of your mind, there's a whole bunch of dialogues going on. And the dialogues going on when you make A number one, the, not the number one A, and make the second A are radically different. I mean, in the same way that there's a larger meaning that a hydrogen atom in a gas is very different than a hydrogen atom in water. Even though, in theory, the two are exactly the same. But that's in theory. And remember, theory is a radical distortion. Abstraction is a radical distortion of the world. It's not the world that is the distortion of the reality. It's our process of abstraction, which we get in part from people like Aristotle, that is a radical distortion of the world. So only in the world of the human imagination are the two ways identical. In reality, real reality, no two A's are ever the same. Because one of the things that you do discover is opposites are joined at the hip. It's impossible to say this is true and that is false. Because if two things are opposites, they're usually both true and they're usually both parts of the same proposition and they usually work together in dynamic tension, struggling against each other and struggling together to make something larger than themselves. Opposites are joined at the hip. Okay, heresy number two. Um, is 1 plus 1 does not equal 2. What? Of course 1 plus 1 equals 2. Well, what happened when you put those two gases together? What happened in 1835 when John Stuart Mill and George Henry Luce were pondering the problem of putting the two gases together? They came, tried to come up with a word for what it was that they saw. And heteronymous causality was John Stuart Mill's brilliant contribution. And, and that went about as far as a dead pigeon. Um, and, and then, and George Henry Luce came up with this word called emergence. Well, that word stuck. In fact, that word became almost a cult item from about 1900 to 1930 when there were all kinds of emergentist movements. But that's the word that stuck around. And because generally when you put one plus one, or often when you put two things together, they make something so violently different than the parts of which those things seem to be made that it defies belief. Just the way that nothing this is the beginning of the universe produced that pinprick, the pinprick produced time and space, time and space precipitated in things, and we can go on and on telling the story of the universe this way. Heresy number three is the, the most sacred law of science, one of the most sacred laws of science, is the second law of thermodynamics. All things tend toward disorder. All things tend toward entropy. Guess what? That law is the most thorough and absurd bullshit in the history of science. The fact that serious scientists who think that they are intelligent believe in this and refuse to part from it because they don't want to be seen as heretics is false. Because look at the universe that you've been watching from your coffee table at the beginning of the universe. Were things falling apart? Did the nothing turn into something even more nothing than nothingness? No, it turned into something, that pinprick. Did the pinprick seem to be satisfied with just being time, space, and energy, which are bizarre enough all on their own? No, it produced things. The things, were they content to be just themselves? Well, they were quarks, an awful lot of them. Quarks are 
incredibly social by nature. They have to exist in groups or they can't exist at all. And those quarks followed social etiquette rules, rules of who to get together with and who to flee. Those are the rules that we call the rules of attraction or repulsion. And they got together in little groups of three. Okay, now add three quarks and what should you get according to Aristotle, one plus one equals two and all of that. According to logic, garbage in, what do you get? Garbage, garbage out, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, put three quarks together and you should get three frigging quarks, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what you get. You get these radically new properties that are unpredictable from the properties of quarks alone, from knowing the elements, from knowing the laws of their elements, called protons and neutrons. Radically different from just three quarks. Radically different from quarkdom altogether. That's not a universe that is constantly stepping down. That's not a universe that's falling apart the way that a sugar cube dropped into a glass of water and stirred slightly, dissolves and disappears. It's doing the opposite. This is a universe in which you start with a glass of water and somehow the glass of water makes sugar cubes. That's what it really is. So the fact that serious men, and these are serious men, who devote their entire lives to thinking about the universe, and that's what scientists do, could ever believe in the second law of thermodynamics and say that, well, you can get an awful lot of things wrong, but if you get the second law of if you don't believe in the second law of thermodynamics, there's no hope for you. Um, that's what uh, Arthur Eddington said. No hope for you at all. Uh, sorry, Arthur, you're a brilliant man. You're an idiot. Um, okay, heresy number four is that randomness is not as random as you think. In evolutionary biology, one of my fields, a awful lot, is predicated on the idea that there are random changes in genes, and those random changes in genes add up, and the positive ones are selected for, and that's how evolution happens. But in, remember when the quarks came precipitating from the nothing? There were gazillions of them, 10 to the 87th power, 10 with 87 zeros after it. Now, if there are 10 with 87 zeros after it things, and this is a random universe, every single thing should be radically different than everything else. And they should have no way to communicate with each other. But that's not the way it is. There are only 16 different forms of quarks, and a gazillion identical copies of each of those 16 different forms. Only 16 forms of quarks? That's not a, that's not a six monkeys at six typewriters accidentally typing out the works of Shakespeare universe. Not at all. That's what we in science would call a rigidly constrained universe. Something is keeping it on a track. Of course, your correlator, corollary generator theory can help explain that, but that's another subject for another time. And heresy number five, the hottest theory in science over the last 60 years has been information theory. There are something like 18,000 books about various applications of information theory right now. There's even IT information technology, which is a billion dollar industry right now. Guess what? Information theory is not about information at all. Not information as you understand it, or I would understand it. In fact, it misses the point. So those are your five heresies. What you do in this book, and in the adventure of uncovering the fact that just about everything you ever thought you knew about the Babylonians, the uh, folks of Katal Hayuk, um, the thinking processes in ancient Egypt, the thinking processes of uh, Kepler and Newton and Galileo, it's all wrong. But the real story turns out to be utterly flabbergasting and, and just amazingly amazing. Cool. And it's very important to remember that the real reality is not the reality of abstraction. That is a distortion. It it's is a... The lens through which we yeah, observe. It's a, and every distortion is extremely useful. Because every distortion, as you just said, is a different lens with which to see reality. And every lens helps us get a bigger handle on how things really work. But never mistake your lens for the reality. When a scientist like Steven Weinberg says the universe is equations, he's mistaking his lens for reality. When quantum physicists say every bit of speck of space in this universe is probabilistic, they're mistaking their lens for reality. What they're really telling you is, my math is the math of probability theory. And because it works, I'm going to claim that my math is the reality. And the sloppy way that reality goes about not quite resembling my math, that's reality's fault. 
But in the process of writing this book, you've gone through one of the greatest adventures in the principle of things right under your nose will turn out to be shocking, surprising, and radically different than you think in your life. So that's the process of writing The God Problem. There's lots more because it was an amazing adventure. And what did it have to do with Bill Chinnick and, um, and what's his name, Ford? Uh, Les, Les Paul. Les, Les Paul, yes, Mary Ford. Uh, and Les Paul, you've worked your ass off. You've revised this 150 times. You've kept discovering, learning new things. You've, this is a detective story. You were on a detective hunt the whole time. And it's been critical to show, to give your audience that sense of suspense. Because senses of suspense and senses of awe and aesthetic senses and senses of wonder all help you perceive. They all help you perceive things in a very different way. And science is all about perceiving things in a whole radically different way. And frankly, so are you. So that's it. That's the God problem. This has been the beauty. And uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this has been the beauty. And no, no. I'm the this brain. is I'm the brain. You this say has, this been, has been the beauty. This, this <laughs> has been the beauty and the and brain. the brain. Right. That's right. Let's do that again. This has been The Beauty and The Brain. <laughs> God damn. I think that's a I think that's a great take actually.